and I'd like to introduce Rick Gold, who will be filling in for Ellen Efros today, who will introduce our speaker and our session. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone, uh, both in the, the Oak Room and, and uh, online. Uh, this uh, course is called Spring Potpourri. And when I look at uh, the word potpourri, it means spoiled pot. Now, why would such a nice uh, word that we think of of flowers uh, be actually uh, come from a concept that uh, both the bad and the good are mixed in? And that's basically because uh, it is a development from the, the concept of stew or meat, where they just threw in anything into uh, mixtures of, uh, of meat and let it cook, and the, the good overwhelmed the bad. But what we have here is actually, in this course, a, uh, a common thread that's going to uh, go through many of our discussions. Uh, and it's going to have to deal with communication and the words. Today, we're going to hear about storytelling. Uh, we're going to hear also about the art of conversation in future classes, uh, spies, uh, conspiracies, everything to do with communication one way or another. So I'm not sure that the word potpourri for, uh, really is the appropriate word. But nevertheless, we have a great course for you. Uh, and um, today we're going to be talking about storytelling. And our speaker today is Josh Perlin, and welcome, Josh. Um, and let me introduce him. Uh, he's a doctoral student at the University of Florida. He earned his BA at uh, Emory University with a major in psychology and he minored in ethics. After gaining further research experience at Duke, he came to UF where he's funded through a National Science Foundation Fellowship. His research focuses on telling one's life story, on how telling one's life story can promote the good life for people of different ages. He's particularly interested in how religion shapes people's life stories across the second half of life. When not doing research, he attempts to live the good life by participating in the faith community, reading widely, spending time with friends, and listening to Americana music. Josh, uh, go ahead. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for uh, that really nice introduction. Um, and hello to everybody on this call. Uh, I'm really, really excited to be here, to be able to share some of the work that I've been doing over the course of my PhD. Um, and I'll just preface by saying that I really hope that this um, talk can be more of a conversation. Um, so feel free to um, just interrupt me. You can unmute yourself if you have a question um, and you can just speak uh, and we can stop there pause for a moment. Um, but you can also use the raise hand function on Zoom if that's something that uh, you'd be more comfortable doing. And I'll try to be on the lookout for that as much as is possible when sharing my screen. Um, so please, please, please feel free to ask any questions as the talk kind of goes on. Um, so I'll just share my screen here. Great. Um, so as, as was said in the introduction, uh, I'm particularly interested in the way that people construct a life story. Um, and it was mentioned that uh, one of my primary interests is in how religion kind of folds into that story. Um, I won't really be talking about religion today, although you can feel free to, um, to just ask about that at the end. Um, and how that relates to some of this work that I'm going to be presenting. Um, but today I'm going to be talking about some work that I did in the first year of my degree on uh, personal stories provided by older adults 
um, on loss and illness and how people find positive meaning even amidst really difficult challenges. Um, so again, I'm hoping this can be kind of interactive. So there'll be some opportunities where you'll get to uh, write down a life story episode of a challenge. Um, you'll get to answer some self-report prompts. Um, and uh, for those, all you'll really need is a pen and paper, or um, you can just use your computer if you're on it. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, let's get started. So let me give you some of the theoretical background of what a life story is and kind of uh, historically where my work is situated. Uh, so past research on autobiographical memory has really focused on a couple of different features, one of which is how much we remember, right? So if you ask someone over the past six years, how many times have you experienced X event or, um, you know, what happened uh, in your 20s, try to provide as many events as possible. So that's really a question of quantity or frequency. And then the other major question that's been addressed by autobiographical memory research is how well people remember the personal past. Um, so that would be something to the effect of um, how many details are you providing and how accurate are those details? Does what you're saying correspond to other people's reports of the same event? Um, and so really, as you can kind of see here, autobiographical memory research was kind of focused on um, the extent to which memory of the personal past is like a tape recorder, right? How much and how well are you remembering the past? But then approximately 30 years ago, the tide kind of started to turn and current research on autobiographical memory started to focus a little bit more on different questions. Like, why do people remember the personal past? I mean, it's, it's an open question, right? As to what the motivation would be to actually recall experiences from our lives. And we experience just a dazzling and dizzying array of different things right? Uh, so why do we, uh, why are certain moments kind of standing out to us as being really important? And so uh, for this question about why, that really brought up the functions of autobiographical memory for the first time in the literature. And so one of the major functions that I'll be talking about today is what's called self-continuity. You can see from this image, right, that this person is looking at a younger version of themselves in the mirror. And what that's supposed to convey is this idea that we feel we're the same person over time. So naturally, one of the functions of remembering the personal past can be to kind of establish that link between who we are today and who we were 10 years ago, let's say, or 20 years ago or 30 years ago. Um, so that's one major function that's gotten a lot of airtime in research on autobiographical memory. And it's one that I'll kind of be alluding to today as I talk about my current research. And uh, related to my current research, the other major question that autobiographical memory researchers have been asking is, in what way do people recall personal memories, right? So once we kind of abandon the idea that memory is a tape recorder, which we all kind of intuitively know is not very true, um, it opens the door for thinking about how do people differently remember the past? And do those differences mean anything? Right. Um, so when we adopt the perspective that memory recall is really an interpretive exercise, it's really focused on what meaning this particular experience has for me, we start to get a lot of rich research surrounding the different ways that individuals will construct a memory. And all of those memories are kind of compiled together into what researchers call the life story. Uh, so Broadly, what is the life story? Well, it's built on this basic presupposition that everyone has a story. Um, so I don't think it takes uh, psychological researchers to really uh, figure this out. I think we all intuitively feel that we have a personal story of where we've been and where we are and where we're headed. And uh, that story ends up framing the way that we think about our personal past. Now, as a part of the story, um, we all kind of know from movies, from books that we love, from television shows, that an interesting story tends to have trouble, right? So something happens that kind of jostles or shakes up the characters in a way, something 
needs to be overcome in a story for it to kind of capture our attention or something needs to go wrong, right? Um, and, and so we can see how an entertaining story um, would require this, but our own life stories also require this. We have peaks and valleys in our life story. We have times that really troubled us. We have times that really challenged our sense of who we are, disrupted our sense of self. Um, and then we also have moments that we think of as turning points in the life story. Um, maybe uh, the turning point is when you met a particular person who uh, got you the job that you ended up working for your entire career. Or maybe it's when you met the love of your life, right? So we all have these kinds of standout self-defining moments in our life story. Now, some stories, despite the trouble that's inevitable in the course of telling it, um, they have happy endings, right? So we all are familiar with this trope of a story ending happily ever after, right? And so this kind of construction of a story in which challenges finally give rise to something really positive is what psychologists have termed redemption. And uh, now I, I actually gave a community talk uh, last semester. And so if some of you are, are in this uh, call and also are a part of the Community Coalition of Older Adults, you might remember a lot of this material because I presented some of it there. Um, but one of the things that I noticed in the course of the conversation with the older adults at uh, CCOA is that this term redemption was very strange. Um, and admittedly, it uh, kind of feels like it has a religious baggage or um, typically uh, Judeo-Christian kind of overtones. Um, and while I'm very interested in redemption as it relates to religious identity, um, I want to just say for the purpose of this talk, just kind of imagine that there is no cultural baggage that this is freighted with, um, that merely what it describes is this sequence in which challenges are overcome. And so, as I just said, how do we kind of understand redemption and look for it in life stories as psychologists? What we look for moments where a negative event, negative affect, leads to a positive event or a positive affect. So um, I just wanna pause here and see if there are any questions about that uh, before giving you an example of a redemptive story that we've worked with in our lab. Okay, so here's an example to make it a little bit more concrete because I know that this whole idea of redemption and negative affect, positive affect, it can feel very abstract. Um, so this is a narrative that we've actually um, collected in our data, uh, one of several, we usually collect about 200 narratives at a time. Um, but this narrator says, so my grandmother passed away in 2013, which was really difficult because she was very young. And I just remember seeing her the final time. I got to be kind of be with her, was, it was kind of traumatizing in a way. And it was just very sad, but very, I think, it sounds terrible, but beneficial as it was a learning experience. So first we notice that the beginning is highly negative, right? She's talking, the narrator here is talking a lot about some difficulties that they were going, undergoing emotionally. She says it was really difficult. Uh, her grandmother was very young and that made it particularly poignant and challenging. Um, and they even say it was kind of traumatizing in a way and very sad. So clearly this narrative is saturated in the beginning with negative affect. But notice what happens at the end. The narrator takes this challenging experience and actually makes some kind of positive meaning of it, all of it. She says, it sounds terrible, but it was beneficial in a way because it was a learning experience. So we can very clearly see this kind of trajectory from a negative affective ex uh, experience or sequence in the narrative to a positive affective sequence at the end. So that is what we look for when we're coding, uh, what's called coding, but when we're reading these narratives and applying a scheme of redemption. So now I wanna uh, take a break because I just talked a lot about some constructs in psychology. And I wanna give you the opportunity to just kind of write down your own life story. Um, I'll give you a prompt, so don't worry. You don't have to come up with, <laughs> with your whole life story right now. Um, and try to write it down in five minutes. But um, 
I want you to just take out a sheet of paper and a pen and just start uh, writing about a challenging moment in your life. Uh, so some questions to kind of ponder as you're doing this are what happened in the event? Who was involved, right? What was the cast of characters, so to speak, if we're using the story metaphor? When and where did it take place? What was the setting? And then finally, I want you to reflect a little bit on what this memory says about who you are as a person. Uh, so do a little bit of that like self-reflective work of what the memory speaks to in terms of your own personal identity and your broader life story. So I'll give you five minutes to just take time to write this uh, challenging life event out. Um, and then I want you to specifically think about what positive outcomes, if any, came from the experience. Now, don't feel like you have to redeem the experience if it, it truly is a challenging moment that, that doesn't need redemption. Um, but maybe try to think about some of the silver linings. Um, so I'll let you have five minutes and I'll just turn off my camera, but I'll be here um, and I'll come back, let's say at, um, let's say at 10.23. All right, everyone, uh, just take maybe 15 more seconds to finish up whatever sentence you're working on. Okay, so does anyone feel comfortable sharing? Uh, we definitely don't have to, but I wanna give folks the opportunity um, to do so if they want. It also obviously makes this more engaging and exciting, hopefully. Anyone in Okamek would like to share? That's no problem. Um, if at any point you feel like you want to share, um, feel free to just, like I said, unmute yourself or raise your hand and we can definitely make space for that. Um, so for now, let's just keep going with the actual research. Um, so now that you've had an opportunity to write out this life story, uh, that's exactly what we ask participants to do. I mean, this is almost word for word the prompt that we use. Um, so if you were a participant in our study, you would come into the psychology building at the University of Florida, and you would just answer this question verbally, um, or maybe even write it out. And um, it would be a kind of semi-structured interview um, in which we'd maybe ask a couple of follow-up questions to things that you've said, but this is a very common kind of prompt. So now that we have done that, and we have that data, so to speak, we take it and we code it for these themes that we find really interesting, like redemption or meaning making or agency or um, a sense of relationship and communion with other folks. So we can code them for a variety of different topics and themes. Um, but I'm gonna focus here on redemption. So, um, we, we know what redemption kind of looks like. It looks like this negative affective sequence leading to a positive affective sequence in a narrative. But the question that I'm kind of interested in is, well, what leads people to be redemptive in the first place, right? Although I prompted you, of course, to provide redemption in your own life story, um, redemption is actually a pretty rare behavior in terms of what we see our interviewees doing. Um, and so it raises the question, is there something um, that would predict or be associated with the likelihood of telling your life story redemptively? And so one of the factors that I've been interested in is age, right? So like anything in psychology, it's bound to be influenced by people's uh, state of life, right? Are they a young adult who's um, just graduating from college and has the whole world and their whole life ahead of them. Um, they're excited to explore different opportunities, to move to new places, to uh, start in a career. Um, so it, they could be, you know, redemptive co redemption could be more likely among those kinds of people, or it could be more likely among people who are older and um, who kind of have an established life, who have a partner, um, who have a career, or maybe are retired from a career. Um, so all of these kinds of factors might influence the likelihood of someone telling their life story redemptively. Another thing that I'm really interested in is uh, the type of challenge. 
So as life story researchers, we just ask people to name a challenging event. We often don't specify what that challenging event is, right? So we don't say, you know, tell me about um, a serious illness or tell me about um, like maybe a relationship difficulty you've had with your family. Um, instead, we kind of leave it open to the participants to tell us what they think their most challenging experience has been or their low point in the life story. And you can imagine that different kinds of challenges that people nominate as being important challenges for their life story, that those might uh, be more likely, more or less likely to be paired with the theme of redemption, right? So perhaps there are some challenges that just don't require redemption or um, where it would feel disingenuous to redeem that experience because it was so difficult or just didn't make any kind of sense. Um, so one thing that comes immediately to mind is um, last year, one of my close friends actually committed suicide. And so um, that was a really difficult experience for me. And at the end of the day, it would feel kind of flip maybe to, um, to try to redeem that or make some kind of positive affective scene from it. Um, instead, the best we can kind of do is accept it um, and continue to live life um, and support those who were close to that person. Um, so type of challenge might really affect the likelihood of redemption. Um, and then another one, and this relates back to that self-continuity function that I mentioned towards the beginning of the talk, is self-disruption, right? So we, we all kind of have experiences in our lives that kind of uh, shake us up and make us wonder, am I the same person that I was, right? Uh, did this event fundamentally change who I am? Um, and so an example from my own life is um, I, I had several concussions a few years back um, and that kind of uh, shook up how I saw myself because I always saw myself as someone who was really bookish. I saw myself as someone um, who liked to kind of stay indoors and study. Um, and for that period when I was recovering from the concussions, I really wasn't able to, um, to sit and read or think deeply about things or um, really commit myself to my schoolwork. And so that really threw me into a kind of existential crisis, as it were. Um, and I wondered, you know, can I be the same person that I was? Um, and eventually I was able to redeem that experience um, by learning new strategies of how to uh, engage with uh, intellectual material and also finding new hobbies and new ways of being in the world. Um, but that being said, it was still a disruptive event for my own understanding of who I was. Um, and so all three of these things, age, type of challenge, and self-disruption might have an influence on the likelihood of redemptive storytelling. So the other side of the coin that I'm very interested in is not only what leads to redemption, but what does redemption lead to? right? Um, are there positive effects of telling a story redemptively that we can empirically assess? And one of those is positive affect. I mean, this seems kind of like low-hanging fruit, right? Uh, if redemption is ultimately about a negative scene going to a positive scene, then we would expect people who redemptively narrate uh, their memories that they would also show uh, greater positive affect. And I see that we have a hand raised uh, from, from ILR. Yes, um, so thank you. Someone... Yeah, go ahead. Thank you, Josh. We have a question here in our Oak Room. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, my question before you go on, my question mm -hmm. is, uh, is redemption always real? Uh, particularly as it relates to older people. In other words, um was the series of events that led up to redemption factual or mm -hmm. did they remember it in a way and then finally uh redemption itself um did it really occur or mm -hmm. was it something they manufactured yeah that is that's an excellent excellent question um, and in terms of life story research, we tend to take the theoretical position that um, it, it really doesn't 
it doesn't matter so much if um, if the redemption itself is something that quote unquote occurred in the real world, right? So you can imagine a redemptive sequence in which someone says, you know, I um, I was dating this person for a long time, um, and then they broke my heart. They broke up with me, or what have you, and um, I I was really crushed by that, but. Um, it allowed me to meet this new person who became my spouse in the end. And so I'm grateful that this negative event happened. So that is something that truly happened in the world. Um, but is that any more or less redemptive than just saying, but you know, this event really um, led me to think of myself as more mature and independent. I didn't need to rely on other people for, for love. Right. Um, is that are those two things basically like equivalent, or um, are they? You know, could they both be termed redemptive, even if one happened in the world and it's kind of observable, and the other didn't? Um, and you could easily say, right, that the person who's saying, um, "I met my new partner because of this experience," that maybe meeting that new partner had really nothing to do with that old experience. They're just trying to interpretively connect their experiences in a way that makes their life story feel coherent and authentic. And so, um, so there is a sense in which redemption isn't, you know, real, but, um, but it has real effects. And um, how people interpret their stories is really important for understanding how they like conceptualize their identity. Does that answer the question? You said yes. Okay, wonderful. Um, are there any other questions before we move on? Okay. Um, so in terms of the consequences of redemption, uh, one would be positive affect. And this is really just assessed by things like um, asking how satisfied someone is with life. Um, are you in a pretty good mood is kind of the colloquial way of, of framing this. Um, and we have found in various studies and other researchers have found that redemption is tightly linked to positive affect, just reporting that you're satisfied with life. But then there's another dimension of well-being besides just feeling like you're in a pretty good mood, right? We all, we all know that um, being happy or um, having well-being is uh, larger than just feeling like you're in a good mood, but it also includes things like having a sense of purpose and uh, having meaningful relationships with those in your life, right? And this is what in psychology, we kind of all clump together under the umbrella of eudaimonic well-being, which we, we think of as things like personal growth, purpose in life, a sense of self-acceptance. Um, so there is some good evidence that redemption does foster eudaimonic well-being as well. So it not only makes you feel good, but it also helps you function well. So what I'll be focusing on today in, in this talk and in the research that I usually do, I focus on these like kind of richer dimensions of well-being, the eudaimonic dimensions about purpose and feeling of personal growth and self-acceptance and meaningful relationships, et cetera. So now I wanna transition into some empirical research that I've done with colleagues during my PhD. And uh, I'll be presenting data from a study in which 99 young adults uh, were interviewed, and these were people between the ages of 18 and 23 years, um, and 88 older adults. So these were folks between 61 and 92 years of age. So you can see that the range of ages is a little bit wider uh, in the older adult sample. Um, and that could present some interesting discussion points for uh, when, when you all see the results here. Um, but that's broadly the design of the study. And we asked them to think back over the past six years of life and narrate self-disruptive challenges. So we were specifically trying to get um, these memories from people where folks felt like it really challenged their understanding of who they are as a person. Um, now, they did differ in the degree to which they felt challenged uh, by that experience and how self-disruptive it was, which we'll get into a little bit when we talk about the data. Um, but we were trying to el um, elicit these self-disruptive challenges in particular. So we took these narratives after we transcribed them, 
and we coded them for redemption. Coding is also sometimes called content analyzing. And we used a standardized code book um, that just grouped redemption into absence of it, so zero, or presence. Did they redeem anything at all? And that was coded as one. And then we also coded for the type of challenge that they narrated. Uh, so we specifically categorized narratives as uh, someone else's death, um, so someone close to you uh, passed away, a personal illness uh, that you uh, individually struggled with, or another person in your life's illness, say a parent or a spouse. Then we also administered some self-report questionnaires, um, and these were perceived self-disruption. Um, so that was just rated on a five-point scale. How disruptive was this to your sense of self? Like I said, there was some good variability in that, even though we did ask for self-disruptive challenges in the first place. And then also these measures of eudaimonic well-being and how that was operationalized here is with two scales growth. So how much do I feel like I've changed as a person because of this experience? And then also self-acceptance. And so I wanna just give you guys a sense of what the questions were um, because sometimes it can feel very like esoteric, like, oh, we administered a self-report questionnaire. Um, but just take a second to rate uh, your memory for um, how much this event disrupted your sense of self. And you can rate it from strongly disagree, one, to strongly agree, seven, uh, with four being neither agree nor disagree. So I'll give you five seconds to do that. Okay, and I do see we have something in the chat. Um, oh, okay. Um, so Lonnie, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Um, would you like to share your story? Um, I'd be happy to. Um, sure. In my 20s, um, I began what was turned out to be a career in writing books on how to do needlepoint. And um, in my early 30s, I wrote a book that turned out to be wildly popular. Uh, in fact, it's been continuously in print for 46 years and has sold over 425,000 copies. And I became a very big fish in a very, very little pond, but still reached all the English-speaking countries of the world, and even some that didn't speak English. And um, in two or three years into that, I was diagnosed with hereditary eye disease. And fortunately, cornea transplants were new, and I had my first one um, probably eight or nine years into this career. And as time went on, um, I had to have more. And my third cornea transplant took my vision to stitch. I could see to drive and read and live life like every other normal person, but I could no longer see to stitch. And that's what I had, my, my life had been consumed with this, what had now become a career, I traveled the country teaching classes, um, and I wrote many other books on the same subject. And now I'm faced with not being able to see to do that anymore. Since I just started this so young, my identity, self-identity was tied to this ability, uh, to the people I met, uh, all the people I met or that I knew in my circle were people who stitched and the people who worked with my husband whom I met at group at the work parties. And here I was no longer comforted by the people who stitch that would made me feel worse. Um, so I withdrew for a long time. And finally, as time went on, I learned to pick myself up and move out and meet people who did other things with their lives. And I learned to create other hobbies. 
Um, and then uh, that went on. And then I had to have more cornea transplants, um, but medical science has kept supporting me. Um, and then maybe 40 years into this career, medical science restored my ability to see to stitch. And that was about five years ago. Oh no, 10 years ago. And I picked up the needle and started that all over again. Um, but I certainly learned that there was life outside of a needle and thread, which was kind of refreshing and a little surprising. So I don't know if that's the kind of story that would interest or support your theory and your group here. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, what a wonderful story. I mean, I'm, I'm very sorry, obviously, that um, that you kind of experienced those um, those difficulties, but um, it definitely sounds like a redemptive story. Um, and those are the kinds of things that we're looking for uh, in our coding um, as as something that could potentially help people's well being. Um, although not in all cases, um, it's a you know it's a mixed bag in terms of the research. But um, but that doesn't make redemptive storytelling uh, right or wrong. It's just another way of telling a life story. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for sharing that. Lonnie, did I get your name right? Is that? Yes, that's right. right. Okay, thank you so much. Um, and I see we have a question from Edward. Uh, I'm assuming self-disruption can be positive as well as negative. One might feel disrupted by discovering new strengths and a better sense of self. Yes, yeah, so um, I, I, think, I think you're right, Edward, uh, that we can have um, positive self-disruption. I think in psychology, we would call that growth or change. Um, and uh, in, in our uh, prompts that we, uh, that we gave to participants to tell their own stories, we really tried to um, emphasize that this was negative. Um, so something that kind of challenged your understanding of yourself. But, um, but I agree that you, you definitely can have self-disruption that ends up being really good for you. Um, so yeah, great question. Um, any other questions or... Um, other stories that folks want to tell? Okay, well, um, let me just check in real quick. Um, how, how much time do we have remaining? I just want to make sure that we can get through as much as possible. Yeah, normally we end uh, about now and turn oh. toward questions and answers. Okay. But, yeah. but you can go on as long as you can, um, okay. as long as you'd like to at this point. Okay. Why don't I quickly just give you guys a sense of some of the results of what we found, and then I'll open it up for questions and discussion. Um, so we'll skip through uh, some of the uh, ratings, um, but those those were the questions. Um, and so uh, just very briefly in terms of age, uh, we actually find no age differences between young and older adults in terms of telling stories redemptively. Um, and in terms of challenge type, we see that redemption was more likely when sharing about another person's illness than another person's death. So to orient you to the graph here, the orange bars are redemption. Hopefully you can see it's just kind of um, reversed, um, but you can see that there's a greater proportion of redemptive storytelling uh, in the other illness and less non-redemptive. And then there's more non-redemptive and less redemptive storytelling in another person's death narratives. Um, so we are seeing significant differences there. And that might honestly be because death is one of those things that kind of uh, demands more acceptance as opposed to finding some silver lining in all of it. And finally, uh, in terms of self-disruption, we do see that redemption is more likely when events were perceived to be more self-disruptive. Um, so that might just be a function of self-continuity, right? Um, if you feel like you're, um, the experience, the challenging experience that you've had uh, somehow jostled your sense of self in a really severe, profound way, um, then redemption can be one of those narrative tools um, to restore that sense that you are the same person over time. Right, so for example, with the concussion story that I mentioned earlier, uh, being able to find alternative ways of engaging with 
academia um, helped me to maintain the sense of self that I had built up over many, many years, um, even if I had to change slightly to do it. So redemption can be the storytelling uh, mechanism by which self-continuity kind of uh, is promoted. And then in terms of what redemption leads to, um, so this is a kind of fancy model. Um, it's mediation is what we call it in psychology. Um, but I wanna first draw your attention if you can see my mouse to this part of the model. Um, so we're seeing a positive association between redemption and eudaimonic well-being. That's not very surprising and that replicates a lot of past work uh, from what we've seen. Um, and we're also seeing though a negative relation between perceived self-disruption and eudaimonic well-being. Again, that seems kind of intuitive, right? Uh, if someone feels like their sense of self has really been shaken up, it would follow that they'd experience less well-being as a result. Um, but what, interestingly, what we're finding is that perceived self-disruption leads to greater redemption. Like I said, redemption can be one of those tools to establish self-continuity. But uh, if the, the way that the statistics work in this model is that redemption is actually buffering the effects of perceived self-disruption on eudaimonic well-being. So to put it differently, redemption is helping people kind of cope with perceived self-disruption in such a way that it's no longer negatively associated with eudaimonic well-being. Um, so redemption can be a really positive tool for maintaining psychosocial and emotional health and well-being uh, in the presence of a challenging experience. So I'll stop there um, and we can just talk a little bit about some of the results. Briefly, I wanna thank um, all of my collaborators, Shubham Sharma, Susan Block, Salwin Lau, and all of the research assistants in Life Story Lab at, uni at the University of Florida. Um, and we can just uh, pause here for discussion. We have a question here and a comment. Sure. Thanks, Jilly. Um, I asked the very first question uh, for continuity uh, mm -hmm. because you don't know who I am, but I am still interested in uh, whether or not one's life. I, I believe that everyone has a life story. Mm -hmm. And some are willing to talk about it and others aren't, but I think everyone has one. I'm particularly interested in whether or not you have any research, ha have done any research to try to quantify whether this life story is actually manufactured. In other words, do you remember things the way they need to be to achieve the outcome that will make you comfortable. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Does, does that um, does it make sense? Am I asking the question? Yes, yes it definitely does. Um, I would kind of take, I guess, the um, maybe a more maximalist or hardline approach and say, I think everyone's life story is manufactured um, to to a large extent um, because all life stories and all autobiographical memory involves interpretation, right? Um, so it's not just that this really challenging experience happened to me, but um, the fact that you've rendered it as challenging in the first place um, already is a layer of interpretation. And I mean, that's even like a very basic layer, right? Um, so, so I think all life stories require interpretation. Um, another great example is uh, the selectivity of memory, right? So we have so many experiences in our lives. I mean, if you were just to enumerate the things that happened to you uh, from the time you woke up this morning to right now, I mean, you could tell a whole, you know, 80s, 80 years worth of life stories within that, uh, that small span of time. Um, but we select or cull different memories um, that we think are particularly important. And they're important because uh, they're interpretively meaningful for how we understand our sense of self, how we relate to others in our cultures, um, things of that nature. And so 
I guess I would say that all life stories are are manufactured. And if you want to say, you know, artificial or not real, I, I would guess I would push back though and, and say like what, you know, what determines the reality of that experience, right? Uh, we're all like kind of living in a world with lots of different meanings um, around us and um, our cultures have already kind of given us stories for how to understand our lives. They've given us scripts for, for the way that our life should unfold. Um, so, so I think the whole kind of world that we live in, our experience world is full of different meanings and stories and interpretations. Um, and the life story is just one dimension of that. Um, but you can feel free to push back on me if you disagree. Um, but yeah, does that, does that kind of address uh, your question? Uh, sort of. I do have a follow up. Yeah, I, please. I, I don't. Um, I believe everyone has a life story. I don't necessarily think that all life stories are manufactured. Hmm, okay. But I'm particularly interested in uh, maybe it's selectivity of memory. Something occurred at a point in time that you remember. Okay. Perhaps mm -hmm. you remember it as you actually experiencing that event. But is it possible that you didn't experience that event, but someone else experienced it and told you, and mm -hmm. it fit your life story to achieve the outcome that you want, and so you remember it as experiencing it yourself? Yeah. Yeah, that, that's a really, really good question. Um, so that uh, that research hasn't been done so much on the selectivity of memory, um, but on um, kind of the the faultiness of our memories. So this was some work uh, that was really initiated by um, maybe you'll know the name uh, Elizabeth Loftus um, and some other folks um, looking at eyewitness testimony, um, and that's kind of how um, the field as a whole transitioned from this emphasis on, um, on how much you remember, right? To kind of the interpretations and the quality of those memories. Um, and so they were really interested in, um, can you implant memories in people, right? Um, can you like, can you change the way that individuals remember things just by introducing kind of new interpretations or even new facts? And they do have a study um, where, they kind of implant this completely fake memory in, in people um, just by kind of making suggestive comments. Um, now that, you know, that study isn't foolproof and there are lots of issues with it that have, you know, come out, right, as, as is true with all psychological science. Um, but I think it does raise an important point that, that um, we often can have these kinds of experiences like you're talking about of this memory actually happened to someone else, but I've now um, integrated it so much into my life story that I remember it as happening to me, and I genuinely believe it happened to me. Um, so, so yeah, that that stuff kind of that happens all the time for sure. Um, yeah, I think it's also healthy. Yeah, yeah, I I think um, it it definitely means that you're you know you're a part of the world, right? Like how um, how wonderful is it, right, that, you know, you can kind of experience uh, the, the memories of the love of your life as being in some way your own, right? Um, I think those things can, can really add a lot of meaning to life, um, and they're not necessarily fake. So I, I do agree that they're, they're healthy. Yeah, did you have any other follow-ups to that, or? And that's all. Okay, great. Yeah, other questions or uh, discussions? We have another comment from Okamet. Yeah. Um, mine had to do maybe with the spin that we put on our life stories and the ones that we tell. Usually, if we're a positive person, we tend to tell the redemption outcome. Mm -hmm. But there are parts of us maybe that haven't been resolved that we maybe don't tell and don't even want to look at. Yeah. Um, did you get into any of those that are probably good topics for therapy or something? 
Yes, yeah, that's that's a really wonderful question. Um, so that I think that does fold into the like selectivity of memory point um, that we were discussing. Um, it, it actually is very um, adaptive and um, advantageous to forget, right? So um, this is some work that's been done by folks like Susan Block at the University of Florida. Um, but in thinking through uh, why do we pick out certain memories as being important for us, there's also the flip side that we intentionally forget certain things um, because they're not fun to remember. And if you had to remember every challenging experience that happened to you, it, it kind of, you know, I, I don't think you'd be able to really be a person, you know, functioning person in the world. It, it wouldn't really be great for your well-being. Um, so, so yeah, I think that uh, one, that it, it can be very adaptive to forget, but maybe also this is a dimension of your question. Um, and you can correct me if I'm mischaracterizing, but it can also be healthy um, to kind of work through memories that you intentionally try to quash um, because they're very difficult and to try to reframe or restory them in a different way so that you can come to terms with it and accept it. And I think that is one of the primary goals of therapy um, is to restory our lives in a healthier way. Um, so yeah, does that answer the question? And do you have any follow-ups to that? Um, no, I think that was very um, insightful. Thank you. Yeah. And do we um, typically end at 11? We're flexible. We, we do what we can here and with whatever time you have. Okay. I don't, I don't think I see any other questions or comments here in the Oak Room. Anyone else online? If you have additional questions that um, you you know you don't feel comfortable asking in front of the whole group, or uh, you you know you just kind of like don't know how to uh, phrase right now, feel free to contact me. Uh, my email is up here. It's pretty easy: Joshua Perlin at UFL Edu, um, and I'm usually pretty quick to respond with emails, and I'd be totally happy to keep discussing this work. Obviously, I find it endlessly fascinating, um, so feel free to to email me and we can chat about any questions you have. So let's all uh, thanks, thank Josh for a really fascinating and provocative uh, presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, please um, uh, be in touch with him if you have anything else you'd like to uh, share. Uh, we're going to be meeting uh, next week. Uh, I think it's the art of conversation. So I look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you. Thank you all so much. I really enjoyed presenting my work.